I'd like to introduce our seminar speaker today, uh, Dr. Jennifer Mandel. Dr. Jennifer Mandel is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Memphis. Dr. Mandel received her PhD from Vanderbilt University uh, in 2008, where she carried out postdoctoral, excuse me, postdoctoral research in plant biology at the University of Georgia before joining the faculty at Memphis in 2014. Uh, research in the Mandel Lab centers around understanding ecological and evolutionary processes that give rise to plant biodiversity. The research uses the Asteraceae family as a model and integrates comparative genomics, population genetics, and phylogenetics. At the University of Memphis, Dr. Mandel teaches courses in ecological genetics, plant ecology, molecular ecology, conservation, uh, and general biology. Dr. Mandel also directs an initiative centered on food and agricultural sciences, sustainability, um, especially within her area in the Mississippi Delta. So join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Mandel. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I was just saying it's really nice to be at a place where everyone loves plants, right? Yeah. And you're not scared of genetics either, are you? No. Okay. That's great. Lots of my students are. All right, thanks for the introduction. I appreciate it. And, and it's been really fun to be here. My family is from, uh, half, half of my family is from Texas, but I've never been to College Station. So it's nice to be here too. So yeah, so as Mason said, yeah, my lab is really interested in, you know, how biodiversity arises. And so we, you know, cross the ecology sort of evolutionary boundary in our lab. And as he mentioned too, we do sort of um, population genetics to comparative genomics, and then even um, really doing a lot of systematics and evolution in, in plants mostly. And our work really kind of spans this continuum from the applied side to the theoretical, I tell people. So a lot of the work we do is in conservation genetics. So we're really interested in how, you know, how populations of rare species are responding in terms of their genetic diversity and how we might augment genetic diversity to sort of help save those species. Sort of in the middle and something I'll talk about towards the end, we're interested in uh, the molecular basis of important traits. So in the sunflower family, that's the inflorescence. And then maybe on the more theoretical side, um, which you know my family is like, what are you talking about? We're really interested in understanding things like phylogenetic discordance. And when we look at nuclear genes versus plastid genes, why do we get differences? Um, are there biological reasons we can kind of understand that from? And yes, we do all of this work mostly in the sunflower family. So it depends where you are in the world and who raised you, if you call it Asteraceae, Compositae, sunflower family, or Daisy family. And we actually, in one of our papers, we did like a Twitter poll to figure out like what should we put in the title um, and Asteraceae went out. Um, but both of those names are botanically still um, allowed by the code. So we work in Asteraceae, it's a great model system. It's one of the, it's among the world's largest flowering plants. So um, second runner up is the orchids. I hope no one studies orchids here. You are second. Um, the Asteraceae has a few more described species, 30,000 plus, and then you can see lots of other large uh, families. So those five families make up about 35% of the flowering plant diversity on, on earth. So cool, mega families. And Asteraceae is so big, we often describe it in terms of the tribes of the family. So those are monophyletic, um, smaller groups. And what's neat, what I'm showing you here, these circles uh, are indicative of the size of those tribes. And so there are some tribes that are, you know, monotypic, they just have one species. And then there are some tribes that are huge, like um, the Senecianae has over 3,000 species. So lots of diversity and lots of questions we can even ask about how biodiversity arises even just within the family. And something interesting, the sister family to Asteraceae is this small family called Calisaraceae. It is restricted to Southern South America. It's only about 50 species. So you even have this pattern of a depauperon sister to this giant sort of radiation, um, even with the family. And so, you know, maybe I don't have to say this here, but you know, what makes an Asteraceae an Asteraceae? So there are a few sort of morphological characteristics. So the most iconic is its inflorescence type, which is the capitulum. So that's, um, you know, a lot of people that I talk to that are, you know, maybe non-scientists or even biologists who just don't study plants don't realize that there are multiple types of flowers within the head of, an, of a sunflower. So two types of flowers in, in like a typical sunflower, a disc flower and a ray flower. But all of them um, in the family are connected by these, uh, this involucre of bracts that essentially creates this capitulum inflorescence. 
And there are a few other features that are um, sort of Sinapa Murphys for the family. So there's um, free filaments and infused anthers. The pappus is a modified calyx. So you think dandelion, that fluffy part, right, is the pappus. And then the family is found on all continents except for Antarctica. Although on the sub-Antarctic islands, there are a few species that have made their way there. And again, you know, an important family in terms of um, horticulture. It's probably the most common garden plant, um, but there are a lot of other uses in the family that just shown here, medicines and human foods and food additives. Horticulture, yay, I'm here. Like, that's fun. I share this slide all the time, right? Um, so yeah, really important in terms of horticulture. All right, so it's four o'clock in the afternoon. I had coffee, but I don't know if you did. So we're gonna play a game and we're calling it Name That Species. Are you guys ready? Okay, so all of these are members of the sunflower family. So I'm giving you that. And I'm, I'm thinking, I was telling my dad, I was like, I think they're gonna make an A because I'm here at horticulture, let's see. Okay, what is this guy? Oh gosh. <laughs> I set you up too much. It's not a Gerber trick. daisy. Gerber daisy. Thank you. Common Mother's Day plant. All right. What is this? Artichoke. Yay. This guy? Thistle. Very good. Very good. The artichokes and thistles are, you know, same tribe. Dandelion. There's that pappus I was talking about. Lettuce. Lettuce. Okay. So one time I was giving this talk and someone, we're going real good. We're, you know, yeah, you know, thistle, dandelion. And then someone went cabbage. And I was like, no. Plant <laughs> family, there's a lettuce flower just to convince you. This one. Pigweed. No. Ragweed. Ragweed. Thank you. That's right. Ragweed. It's a nice photo of ragweed, actually. This one. This one is kind of hard. No. Yeah. 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 So it's stevia. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. That's also a specialty crop. This one's easy. Sunflower, awesome. Okay, yeah, so I showed you a lot of sort of, you know, very um, iconic and common, but in the sunflower family, it's fascinating. There are so many different habits, so many different, um, you know, uh, inflorescence types. So this tree is a, a genus called Daisy Phillum. It is from Southern South America. That's, that's in the Asteraceae. These are the silver swords. I mentioned I would highlight them in the in the talk. So these are the Hawaiian silver swords, sort of a um, uh, long studied evolutionary radiation in Hawaii. And then these, I think everyone here is gonna think this is super cool. So about 40 places across the family, uh, a trait, um, a secondary head trait has evolved. So we got a single sunflower head, which has ray flowers and disc flowers, but about 40 times throughout the family, We've taken multiple heads and condensed them down into a secondary structure. So it's a head of heads. And I think you can see this. Um, and this is a species from South Africa. And so you can, there's about, there's nine heads in this structure. So there's the cross section there. And what's really neat too, are the rays on the periphery. The ray, it, each head has rays, but that peripheral rays are really long. And the ones in the center are really short. So from you know afar, it still looks like that sort of false flower, like a, a sunflower. So I think that's just really cool. Um, if anyone wants to study that, um, talk to me. Cool. Okay, so we asked this question in our lab, you know, why are there so many sunflowers? Why has this family been so successful? You know, what, what's going on here? And like a lot of big radiations, there are a number of hypotheses that you know, people want to test about why certain groups of organisms have become so speciose. So things like, you know, maybe there's something about the climate, maybe there's something about novel traits that have evolved, uh, polyploidy certainly could play a role, dispersal and niche colonization, and then things like hybridization and introgression or gene flow. So uh, we look at, you know, all of these hypotheses and we use sunflower family as a model. And so before I kind of get into some of our data, I just want to tell a little bit about the history and the taxonomy in this group. It's really neat. Uh, the family was um, really nicely described in terms of sort of taxonomy in the late 1700s by this French uh, botanist whose name you might recognize because his family was, um, they were, um, oh my gosh, astronomists, thank you, I almost said physicist, astronomist um, in, uh, in France. And so what Cassini did was based on really small micro characters uh, of the sort of anthers and stigmas, 
he essentially separated out the um, cl classified and separated them out into tribes. And um, what was really neat that he said, I mean, again, 1826, you know, microscopes and, and not access to, you know, material from all over the world, he was able to recognize essentially 19 or 20 natural groups or natural tribes. And one thing that was neat that I'll come back to later is he said that, you know, even though he could separate them into these tribes based on their morphology, there were a number of sort of um, mixed characters, mix of characters that were present in multiple tribes. And, and so, you know, even sort of early offering this idea that there could be ancient hybridization or gene flow in, in the origin of these lineages. And this is a drawing that he did. Um, yeah, I think there's some seats up here. <laughs> um, and so this is a drawing that essentially is, is kind of showing circles are each of these tribes. And when they're, they're next to each other in this order, it's like those tribes were more similar to one another based on morphology. But if you see, he drew these lines in between them. So those are the tribes where he saw there could be a mixture of characters um, between the two. So early sort of work on that. And so then I'll just zoom forward like 120 years or more. Um, I can't do math, 200 years. Um, and the state of the family when I first started working on the family as a whole was that there was a, a plastid sort of meta tree phylogeny. And this was work by um, Vicki Funk, who, who, who in here, does anyone know Vicki? Did, did you know this name, Vicki Funk? She was a Smithsonian curator um, uh, for Asteraceae. So she was um, all things Asteraceae. She passed away in 2019, but she left a mark on a lot of people, especially young scientists. She was always at conferences, you know, people wanting to come talk to her and she would, she would say hi and then she'd introduce you to these people and just say that you were awesome to these people, you know. So she did that to a lot of people and I think that it was, it was really, um, it got a lot of people's career sort of um, off the ground. But when I met her, the state of the family was such that there were a lot of sort of gaps in our understanding of the evolution, especially on the backbone of the phylogeny. So that just made it difficult to ask any question about, um, you know, niche colonization or polyploidy or gene flow. We really need to have like a base phylogeny to begin to ask these evolutionary questions. And it was 2009, so uh, next generation sequencing was um, getting real hot. And so she said, she met me, I was a postdoc, and she was like, let's, let's collaborate on something, you know, I've got some money, let's do some next gen sequencing. Um, and that's sort of where this collaboration started. But a couple of reasons the family uh, was difficult to study in terms of sort of um, nuclear genes was, you know, the, the, well, the plastid genome is not very variable, and so that made it difficult. And then in terms of nuclear genes, there's a lot of duplications, whole genome duplications, polyploidy in the family. So making it um, challenging when you just have a couple of markers. And so what Vicki and I did together um, was to essentially develop some tools. And we wanted to you know, create a set of genomic tools that lots of people could use so that you could you know, do a study in some group of sunflower, but use the same tools and kind of talk, cross-talk across you know, um, different groups. And so what we did, who in here knows what an EST is? I'm trying to see how old everybody is. <laughs> right. Yeah, so we used express sequence tags because this was 2009. So these are kind of like low pass transcriptome sequencing. And so we didn't have a lot of data, uh, but we were able to design uh, a set of, uh, target a set of genes, about a thousand genes that we were hoping were mostly single copy so that we could use those for phylogenetics. So we did that with three species that were, um, had data available, that's sunflower, safflower, and lettuce. Um, there was a composite genome project going on and so there were data for that. And what we did was we designed this probe-based enrichment method. This is what we were talking about at lunch. So we had a thousand genes that we wanted to target and we had this um, these sequence and we designed RNA baits that are specific to these thousand genes. And that's what these little, um, little dashes are showing. So they were 120 base pair baits. They overlap so that we're essentially kind of fishing out the genes that we want. So it's a reduced representation method. So we can essentially hybridize our DNA with these baits and then just sequence those thousand genes that we want. So it's, um, it's called HybeSeq. So this is the workflow. We start with DNA. Uh, and that was important because uh, a lot of work um, with RNA was starting to happen, but you know we wanted to be able to look at herbarium samples. We wanted to be able to 
you know, use dried samples from the field. A lot of the species we study are difficult to collect. So it's hard to get liquid nitrogen to Patagonia. Um, so uh, we were, we wanted a DNA approach. So essentially create a library, you do the hybridization, and then you do some sort of, usually we do short read sequencing like Illumina. And this is kind of a zoomed in view of the middle part, the hive seek part. So we have um, red and orange are genes that we wanted to target. Gray is something that we don't want. And then our baits are biotinylated. So we can use um, a bead that will have affinity for that biotin. And we can essentially kind of wash off the rest of the genome and just sequence that small bit. So it's been really um, a useful tool for us. And because we designed it to be like these conserved genes, we've been able to use it across the whole family. And accidentally, it works in carrot, in case you're wondering. Um, we had a mix up in the lab, and we got some <laughs> carrot DNA in there a long time ago. Um, so what we decided to do was this like pilot study where we had the phylogeny, and we, we chose taxa where we knew the relationships. We were pretty confident we understood those. And then we just ran our, our probe set to try to um, generate a phylogeny with that, that smaller set. And it worked, so our you know pilot study seemed successful, and so off we were running uh, to do uh, a lot of sampling across the family. So again, thirty thousand species all over the globe. So that was a big challenge to try to think about how do we sample? What's our question? You know, is it that you know we really wanted to start with the backbone, but even how do you ensure that your sampling um, is is sufficient? So we thought a lot about that. And we decided that we wanted to make sure we sampled all those tribes. So they're about 45 to 50. We also wanted to sample from genera that are really large. So the stevia that I showed you, that is a really large genus, about 400 species in South America. Um, so, you know, we definitely wanted to tag those. And then we have these monotypic genera. So these are species that are just one off. They're unique. They might be just a whole subfamily. So we wanted to make sure we, we sampled from those. And then I mentioned collection feasibility, material age, and herbarium uh, material. So this image here is from Patagonia, and it's a species called Famatinanthus. And it's really neat. I've never seen it in person, but that's it all over the sort of mountainside. It's a, a sort of woody shrub. It has a white flower, and um, Vicky got to collect that. Um, so beautiful. All right. Uh, another thing that came about from this, it's it's kind of neat, you know, if you study a global species, a global family rather, you're going to have to collaborate globally, right? And so we ended up, um, these are just numbers of how many species in the sunflower family are on each of the continents, but we've ended up, uh, you know, collaborating with just lots and lots of people across the globe, uh, lots of different herbaria, lots of researchers that are just working in specific areas of the family. And out of this is also, uh, I've been heavily involved with TICA, which is the International Composite Alliance. So especially during COVID, it was really um, nice because everybody got on Zoom and we would do talks and, and things like that. And people would get up at like midnight to come to our talks. And that was really neat. Uh, so we, we collaborated globally because we had to, because that's where the plants grow. And then another neat thing that came about was our probe set essentially became a catalog item at Arbor Bioscience where we um, collaborated to create these probes. And so I don't get a kickback. Um, I don't even think I get a discount when I order them. Um, but <laughs> but uh, the, um, the probe set is available for anybody to buy. So a lot of people have bought, them, bought it over the years. And so that means that their data and our data can be integrated together. So that turned out to be really um, awesome. Uh, again, just things that, you, you know, we didn't realize would happen, um, but they did. And so after we sampled, you know, um, all the, a couple hundred uh, taxa, we uh, published this paper where we worked on the backbone of the phylogeny, and we had all the subfamilies, 45 tribes, and over 200 genera. And I'll just point out, like, the um, collaborators here, Ram Thapa was a grad student in our lab, and he was from Nepal. Linda Watson, uh, faculty at Oklahoma State. She was the, she was the head um, there for a long time. Carol Siniskalki was a postdoc in our lab. She's from Brazil. Um, that's Vicky with the um, Senecio uh, in her hands. So she was at Smithsonian. 
And then Rebecca was a postdoc at the time at Smithsonian. So just a diverse group of um, career stages working on the project, which I always thought was really neat uh, working on this project with them. So we published this phylogeny, which was sort of the, um, at the time, kind of like the, the biggest sort of backbone phylogeny for the family. And so I've got your familiar species above um, and they're in their phylogenetic order there. And what this allowed us to do is, it was a lot of work to get this phylogeny, but now it's a jumping off point for being able to test this hypotheses about, you know, why is this family so successful and, and you know, what are sort of the ecological and evolutionary reasons. And so I'll tell you some major takeaways from this phylogeny that we, um, but before I get into the hypotheses. So when I started studying Asteraceae, I learned it was about 40, 45 million years old, but there was a lot of um, missing sampling from some of the South American lineages and some other folks did molecular clock dating and essentially doubled the age of the family. And uh, our work also aligns with that sort of older age, so about um, 80 million years old, which I'll show you a phylogeny in a second. There were some major um, topological changes in the phylogeny, so moving around um, on the phylogeny that influenced our understanding of the, the historical biogeography. And one thing that was interesting, the tribes remain monophyletic. So 19 of the tribes that Cassini described are still recognized as monophyletic tribes today. So you don't move out of your tribe. You're in a tribe, you're, you stay there. Subfamilies moved around, but those tribes just have a lot of morphological and genetic affinity. It's really neat. Yeah, but there were a handful of new subfamily classifications. And this is a species uh, that's from South America. And I've been told that it would look good as earrings. I feel like it would. Yeah, yeah. Got any artists out there? Um, OK, so here is sort of a chronogram, uh, a time tree of our phylogeny. And what I've got on the bottom is the, the dating. So 100, I hope you can see 100 million years to present. Um, and then this is a, a color-coded sort of biogeography that I'll walk you through. The tribes are shown on the side there with the size um, of the tribes, so if, um, 3,000 species in the Asteraeae. And then the pie charts are the biogeography, and, and I'm going to walk us through this, but a couple things I'll point out. So 83 million year sort of origin based on molecular clock dating, which uses fossil calibrations. And we saw, we, we also tested for sort of diversification rate shifts, so increases in species numbers across the phylogeny. And we saw that a lot of times those coincided with these major uh, dispersal events, um, especially sort of transcontinental dispersal events. And those are shown in red arrows. All right, and so we're gonna start from the beginning. We're in the, the late Cretaceous, 83 million years. The family likely originated in Southern South America around that time. And there was some movement from Southern South America into the, the rest of South America but the majority of the species that are still there today are these um, interesting, this is a Barnadesia spinosa. So those are spines that are um, really long and that's like a tree stalk. So again, that's in sunflower family. And we have mused about this thing for a long time because it's in, you know, it's in the Cretaceous, the dinosaurs were still there. And we were like, there were definitely dinosaurs eating Asteraceae at that time. And that's why there are so many spines. So that's just sort of interesting. We also thought this would be a funny cover for PNAS, but they, we didn't submit it. Um, OK, so 83 million years, the mass extinction um, event, uh, about 65 million years. Not a lot happens in our phylogeny until around the Eocene, 52 million years. And what I'm showing is sort of the biogeographic route that the family took out of South America and the timing of that. And so Southern South American origin, this pie chart is showing that there's essentially an equal likelihood that the family migrated out of South America to North America or over to Asia or to Africa. Um, that piece is still a little bit of a mystery. Yellow wins out just slightly, but there's some migration out of South America in the Eocene. And this coincides with um, an interesting climate um, optimum, the EECO, where um, the global temperature rose about seven degrees Celsius. And so, you know, climate changing uh, across the globe, dispersals sort of happening at the same time. 
And then uh, whatever pathway we took out of South America, once we got to Africa in um, the Eocene about 42 million years, there was just explosive uh, speciation and radiation out of Africa. So about 95% of the extant diversity in the family originated around this time in um, out of Africa. So dispersal to all continents um, from that time. And again, this also coincides with another major climate um, optimum uh, in the, on the, across the globe. And then uh, in 23 million years, we look in our phylogeny and we also see really high rates of acceleration of, of species diversification at that time. We also, when we look at the fossil record, fossil pollen record, we have a lot of fossil pollen at that time. And that is shown again by these red arrows. We also see this um, decrease in atmospheric CO2 at that, that time, 23 million years. And this is not our work, uh, this figure, but um, from a, a colleague where they looked at the rise of grasslands, which are very diverse in terms of the grass family and, and Asteraceae, and looked to see if there were some correlations or uh, a, a way to explain the rise in grasslands. And they found that this sort of um, drastic drop in atmospheric CO2 also coincided with the expansion of these grasslands. So um, really thinking about climate change and dispersal and niche colonization, so these grasslands opening up and diversifying um, at that time. And that pattern plays out both in, in daisies and in grasses. And from that paper, I really liked, they had this quote, they found this quote from a botanist in Wisconsin from 1970s who said that in terms of biomass, the grasslands, the grasses have, have it beat. There's plenty of grass biomass. But in terms of species diversity, the daisies certainly have it beat. So he proposed that maybe we ought to call them daisy lands and not grasslands, right? So I like that. I like that a lot. OK. So we, uh, from, from this phylogeny, we were able to look at taxonomy and sort of reclassify some of the families. As I mentioned, the tribes all remain monophyletic, but the subfamilies shifted around. So we described 16 subfamilies and 50 tribes from this work. And it was just right before Vicky passed away. So we were able to dedicate that classification, that reclassification to her. And again, because the probe set works across the family, we have been really uh, fortunate to have lots of people want to come to Memphis and learn to do what we're doing and bring their own DNA and sometimes their own funding and study their you know, sort of group in the family. Um, and, and hang out with us for a while. So you can see that there are people that, you know, have come from, from both the U.S. and from further out. And we've had folks work on just one genus or, or a tribe, that sort of thing. So it's been really neat um, to get people to come, come to Memphis. Okay, so I mentioned that we are testing all these hypotheses, and I showed you a lot about the climate and niche colonization, but polyploidy is something that we know uh, it is involved in driving you know, novel, novel traits, speciation. And this is a, a phylogeny, a study that Jacob Landis did where they were looking at um, diversification rates and how that coincided with whole genome duplications. And there's a very strong signal in the Asteraeales, which is the order where the Asteraceae resides. And so we wanted to, you know, ask this question with, now that we have this phylogeny, you know, are there, is it, what, what evidence do we have for whole genome duplication event? And is that correlated with any of these sort of major shifts or major speciation events? And one thing that's been lacking for a long time is a sampling of the South American lineages. And that, again, is, is part of the reason why the family was thought to be so young, 40 million years versus maybe 80 million years those South American lineages, which were probably the early lineages, were unsampled. And so with collaborators down in Uruguay, we've been able to do some uh, transcriptome sequencing because RNA later does work pretty well. So you can go out to the field and, and sample the leaves and put them in RNA later and then do transcriptomes. So we've been able to use that to look for bursts of shared duplications, which will allow us to essentially map onto the phylogeny where we have whole genome duplication events. So we can do that. And again, this is our base phylogeny. And if we use transcriptome data to um, assess evidence of whole genome duplication, that's what these uh, green stars are showing. 
So you can see there's one at the base of the family, and that is actually shared by the sister family, Clisteraceae. So it seems like it um, would have been a neat story if Clisteraceae didn't have one and then Asteraceae did because it's the small sort of 50 species um, to the 30,000, but both share it. But then there's another event that happens sort of at the core Asteraceae. So it skips those, that, those spiny trees and the earrings. Um, those don't have evidence for a whole genome duplication event. So the core Asteraceae does, and that's that second green um, here. And then a lot of sort of lineage specific gene duplication, whole genome duplications are mapped here. And there's one that's pretty well known, this at the base of the Helianthae. So that's where the sunflowers, the crop sunflowers reside in the family. So we wanted to ask, well, if we get a whole genome duplication event, does that coincide with some diversification upshift? And the answer is like, yes, sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. So uh, what does that mean? Well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But what we did you know, start to realize, and, and again, something that we didn't know was gonna be so useful when we were developing probe sets for a thousand genes is that now what we can do is we can ask about how often do genes tell us the same evolutionary story? So we call that um, gene tree discordance or, or concordance. So we have a thousand genes, we can stick them all together and create a phylogeny, or we can look at them individually and create a thousand phylogenies and, and then ask the question, how often are they telling the same sort of evolutionary pattern? And so when they don't, we call that gene tree discordance. And we map that across the genome and we begin to think that when we have these whole genome duplication events, that may be um, an underlying sort of biological cause of this discordance that we see, um, one, one cause of that. So again, mapping those onto the phylogeny, uh, we can see that sometimes they do coincide and sometimes they don't. And maybe there's some lag time as well where we have a duplication event and then we have this discordance. But then that also got us thinking that, you know, I mentioned polyploidy and, and hybridization and gene flow. And we think a lot about hybridization in contemporary populations, but this is thinking about hybridization sort of in the, in the ancient times and the, the origin of the family and, and what role does that play? Can we tell a signal from that? And these are still open questions for phylogenetics and, and they're pretty, you know, maybe they're kind of old because Cassini realized it, but at the same time, they're, they're, we don't have the tools yet to really be able to disentangle this. We've got a lot of genes, we have a lot of gene tree discordance, but we're really um, at a point where we, we need to develop new tools and people are working on that. Um, and we're hoping that, you know, they'll work on that and we have the data for them, right? So thinking about this idea of a phylogeny not being bifurcating or just, you know, one thing to do, um, if that's me, sorry, my hair. Um, but having sort of this network analysis or this sort of um, ability to have hybrids in a phylogeny is something relatively new to phylogenetics. It's not really new to evolutionary biology though. We've long known this classic paper by Anderson Stebbins that gene flow and hybridization events can, you know, they automatically increase genetic diversity in the offspring and they can spur sort of speciation or adaptation to novel environments and that sort of thing. And we also know that hybridization is really important in a lot of our crops um, and polyploidy as well as in a lot of our invasive species. And so, you know, what role and what can our data tell us about gene flow and hybridization and that sort of thing? So we can ask these questions about reticulate evolution in the family. So this is a bifurcating tree, but we want to ask whether or not we can, you know, generate a network phylogeny with, with our data. And so it um, turns out we wanted to look at places where we had these whole genome duplication events, because that could be indicative of an allopolyploidy event. So um, two parents producing a, a polyploid. And then in areas where we have gene tree discordance, so maybe these polyploidy hybridization genome duplications are, are leading to that, that sort of underlying discordance. And it turns out we can use our same tools, we can use our, our probe set, and then there are some phylogenetic network approaches now uh, that are based on um, coalescent theory. The challenge is that you really can't run more than 20 um, samples through an analysis like this. And so we have to think about either we're looking at a very small part of the phylogeny and we've sampled everything, or if we wanted to look across the 
whole family, how do we sample that and what are we losing? And this, this is really ongoing work. We've done a lot of like, well, let's pick these 15, 20 taxa and generate an analysis and then see how the sampling changes. So this is an area that is, um, a lot of people are working in this, a lot of you know statisticians and mathematicians are thinking about this challenge but it's definitely something to look out for. I think um, it's, it's limiting in, in our understanding of the role of gene flow. Um, but we do our best, and one of the places we've looked at it is in um, these five tribes that we call the Fab Five. That was Vicky's name for them. Uh, they are Asterii, Nephalii, Calendulae, Senecianii, and did I say, what have I missed? I don't know what I missed, Asterii? We'll see in a second, now I've forgotten. But there are these five tribes that make about 10,000 species, um, Anthemidae. So that's where um, Chrysanthemum is. But so these, these five tribes are about 10,000 species in the family. So it represents this you know, giant increase in diversification. And the um, phylogeny on the top right there is showing wherever there's red, there's a lot of gene tree discordance. So a lot of the gene trees that we look at are not telling the same sort of story. And there's another probe set. Um, I actually made a slide one time. I've never used it, but it's like um, the We Don't Talk About Bruno. And it's like, we don't talk about this other probe set. <laughs> They're nice people. Um, but there's an angiosperm 353 probe set that works across all angiosperm taxa. And so we can also run that probe set. And we also see a lot of discordance. So this group just has a lot of phylogenetic discordance. And so we wanted to say, you know, is there any evidence for network-like evolution or reticulate evolution or hybridization in, the, in the, um, these 10 tribes? And we see a lot of it. We see it within tribes. We see it across tribes. And so the red lines are essentially showing that there's some evidence of, of shared genome ancestry or, or, or hybridization across those those terminals or those lineages. And so gene flow, we also know in this group there's been lineage specific polyploidy events. So we've got a mess. We've got gene flow, we've got polyploidy. And it may be that that's connected to the success of this group. These are some of the largest tribes in the family. Senecio has more than 3,000 species. So um, definitely evidence for deep particulation and, and polyploidy in that group. Okay, and so the last sort of um, trait that we are, have been interested in is this idea of how novel traits arise. And you know, start with the most iconic for the family, that's the capitulum, but we are definitely interested in other traits that I'll talk about in just a second. But we're really interested in this question of you know, what evolutionary processes have arisen to, to give, you know, give new traits? How, how, does, how does novelty evolve, right? That's like the question that all evolutionary biologists want to ask. And so we've started here with the capitulum, and this is like the top uh, front view, back view. Now you can see the, the green involucral bracts on the, on the back of the head. So we're going to ask this question. So all members of Asteraceae have a capitulum. So they have this um, you know, loss of terminal flower in the center and this loss of this sort of branching cymos unit so that it's all in this um, you know, single re receptacle. The sister family that I mentioned a couple times, that's Closeraceae, it has a head-like structure. It's called a cephalioid, um, but it has a terminal flower and it does have some branching um, in, the, in, in, the, in the structure. And then out from there are the Goodenaceae and the Minyanthaceae that have different inflorescence structures. So we're really interested in, you know, maybe the family's been so successful because of the evolution of this inflorescence type. Maybe that's part of its success. So we want to know, how do you make that? What are the genes? And, you know, again, this is where it's interesting for an evolutionary biologist, but it also could have some value, right, for, um, for uh, crops or applied sort of work. So this is how I met Sashi, I was giving a talk at the PGRP meeting in uh, September where we um, just got this grant a year or two ago. It's a collaboration with Auburn and University of Georgia to really ask this question about the molecular basis of the capitulum, but use this um, comparative genomics approach. Auburn, or Daniel is a developmental uh, geneticist, so he really is interested in you know, the stem cell signaling and, and those pathways. 
And then we're adding some functional analyses to this question. So really trying to integrate across these approaches to ask, how does this novel form arise? So we're doing a lot of genome sequencing in the family. And uh, as large as the family is, it's really underrepresented in terms of genome sequences. So only about 40 species have been sequenced out of the 30,000. So we're doing a lot of genome sequencing uh, in the family. And then I keep you know, harping on about the capitulum is, is a unique feature in Asteraceae, but it turns out there are, there are a couple other places where a capitulum has evolved and they can fool you. So in the carrot order, in the carrot family, um, APACE down at the bottom, that species looks like a thistle. Uh, that picture maybe isn't doing it justice, but I once saw it at a conference. It was the wildflower of the year. I was sitting with my students and I was like, oh, look, the thistle. And then they're like, this is in the carrot family. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> bad botanist. But it, it is a, it's a thistle-like capitulum. And so, so that's evolved. And then in the Dipsicales, there's a group of species that, that's on the top there. Scabiosa, if you know that, that's that species. It's also um, available sort of horticulturally. So that also evolved a capitulum inflorescence. And so we want to ask the question, you know, is it the same genomic mechanisms that have led to these, you know, independent origins of this phenotype that is so common across the family, but is kind of popped up in these other plant families? So, so that's sort of a, a next step question. And so, you know, really uh, thinking about Asteraceae as, as a model for evolution and, and what's next for us. And as I've mentioned, this idea about hybridization and the role that it plays in spurring diversification, that's gonna be really important. Um, and I think we're, we need to develop the tools, the, you know, the models and things, and, and certainly Asteraceae is a great place for that. And then integrating additional traits. So the Pappus is something really interesting to us. So that's again, the, you know, the dandelion fluff. And that really aids in dispersal in many species, um, not in all. The Pappus is really, it's even more diverse than capitulum. There are maybe like 10 or 12 ca different capitulum types that we, we describe across the family, but Pappus, it's, it's like, I don't know, a lot more. And so there's so much diversity in that Pappus. Uh, so we're really interested in that. And then the secondary chemistry in the family has also been proposed to be something that's in an evolutionary novelty and maybe um, helped the family sort of uh, become so successful. So we'll keep on working on that. And then just to let you know, it's not all sunflower lady here. Um, we do other stuff in the lab. Uh, randomly, we have worked on aflatoxin population genetics. Uh, that was fun. Uh, we do a lot of, I have just a lot of interest in crop wild genetic diversity, and we talked about that um, before. When I got to, to Memphis, I actually had USDA money to study carrot, so I said, which is why it was terrible that I didn't know that that other thing was in the carrot family. But uh, we we studied sort of the idea of transgene escape and and sort of the biological processes that give rise to that in crop wild sunflower microbiome and and something else that I've been really interested in lately is this idea of biodiversity informatics. There are so many like like carbon credits sort of thing, but biodiversity credits are are becoming this I keep hearing companies are talking about their biodiversity footprint. So really trying to think about scientists need to be talking to those folks that they're throwing those words around and there's no scientists in the room. So really thinking about what does it mean to protect biodiversity? It's not the same as carbon, right? Biodiversity is a local sort of thing. And so you really need to understand what you have and, and what you're going to lose. So we've been really interested in, in that for a while. Um, so yeah, okay. And I'm early, so I have, I don't know what that called, it's not working. I have lots of time for questions for y'all, but I'll just uh, thank a lot of people uh, over the years who've helped on things. We have our lab website there and we, Tika, the International Composite Alliance publishes a gorgeous journal. Please capitulum journal. Look at that one. My website's not gorgeous. The one on the bottom is, um, it's a, it's a scientific peer, peer reviewed journal, but we've taken a different style on it. It's, I don't want to say, but it kind of is like National Geographic style, like full images and, and really gorgeous work um, that Mauricio Bonificino is the co-editor on. And then, uh, yeah, funding and then questions.
mind repeating the questions for people online. Yes, I can do that. I have a question uh, as someone who was trained in traditional taxonomic theory at Cornell. Awesome. Uh, what, what led to the mutual acceptance of uh, Asteraceae with compositing? With the name? Yes. I think it's because it's such a big family. We just, we have to let both names be okay with the code. Yeah. <laughs> But it is, it, yeah, there's, what did we were talking about at last night at dinner? I can't remember. There's, there are two other plant families that are allowed to be called by both their sort of tr more traditional name and their more specific. Is it leg, leg you may see and fe base e? Is there one more? I thought there were three. Maybe there are just two. That's one. Yeah. Yeah. But sunflowers are just special. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting because not fights but I've definitely had disagreements with folks about like what we should call things because you know they want to call it composite but then not everyone recognizes that that's also asteraceae so yeah you can use both though okay thank you my question is uh, with given so many species in there are there instances where like uh, you know sausage and microfungi are usually in the fungal description so in this case are there strictly in the fungal yeah the discordance so the questions about um plastids and mitochondrial maternal inheritance or maybe the lack of that so it's funny i when i first started that carrot grant we were looking we're doing a lot of paternal leakage studies to, to look because the idea of putting a transgene into a chloroplast, for example, would be fine if it can stay in the seed, but if it can, you know, get transported out by a pollen, how often does that happen and things. So for years I've been trying to run away from that, but now you've asked me the question about plastids and mitochondria. So yeah, there certainly when you make wide crosses that we see more evidence of, of that sort of, you know, lack of paternal, lack of maternal inheritance. So that could be a, um, a case. The mitochondrial genomes of plants are like beasts, you know? Uh, so they're often really challenging to even use for phylogenetics. We, we stick with plastids, but mitochondrial genomes are, are very complicated to, to use for phylogenetics. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I think. And you're not the first person who's asked a question similar to that, that discordance and is it, it could it be like, rare leakage and that's why there's some discordance there because even when we you should be able to look at a, a plastid genome and a mitochondrial genome they should also tell the same story unless there's some shenanigans there so yeah great question yeah a lot of those polyploids that you talk about or they theorize they were polyploids and now they're different so which ones which oh so the which ones? discordance yeah um some of them are for the most part we tried to target um, diploids in our in our work but they are uh the older polyploids that have then sort of diploidized but yeah so some of them will be uh, i can't remember right now but we that was another thing to sort of try to because they're smaller genomes and maybe a little bit easier to um, deal with duplicates that's a thing that has been very challenging our probe set i didn't show it um, but we've designed a new probe set that ha we used real transcriptomes and a lot of them to design much better single copy genes. These thousand genes, there's a lot of duplicates, even though we were trying to just find single copies because there's been so many duplicates. So we have another probe set that's fewer single copy. Is there a Yeah, I mean, when we annotate, there's there's usually fifty to sixty thousand. Yeah, yeah, and the genomes are highly repetitive, like many plants, seventy to eighty percent repetitive um, in some flower. So <laughs> he said, "Hey." <laughs> How to. Yeah, so the original probe set was based on uh, a set of 
conserved ortho, a conserved ortholog set cost set that came out of Arabidopsis. So we used that set, which was more genes than that, um, maybe 1400 or something, but then we kind of filtered down. Another issue I didn't mention was those were transcriptomes, right? And so we didn't know where the intron exon boundaries were in 2009. So we aligned with Arabidopsis and essentially, you know, guessed if there was a, a boundary in Arabidopsis, then we did not design a probe to cross that boundary. Um, but yeah, so there are lots of different kinds of genes in that suite but it was the conserved ortholog set from Arabidopsis from along, yeah. Clearly, this is a very interesting and useful horticultural uh, plant, and uh, uh -huh. so, uh, everybody will notice this really bright yellow uh -huh. flower uh, color. And uh, do, do you see, the, I'm not sure whether you did this, um, is there any particular kind of uh, trait you find uh, to flower color. So yeah, we haven't done, we, we've done, you know, when I did association mapping in sunflower, we did a little bit of floral ray flower color mapping. Uh, we have done some studies. So in, in a group of Brazilian plants that Carol studied, there were, there are like 18 species and all of them, but two had purple flowers and two were hummingbird pollinated and red. And so we assumed those were probably closely related and they weren't closely related at all. They're sort of independent origins of that red flower. We haven't done any sort of molecular mapping or, or function, but yeah, the, the, the color variation is, is wild. Um, so yeah, that's definitely good. Good question. So uh, with a lot of flower species, foliar levels can have interesting effects on the morphology of the mm -hmm. flower and then the rest mm -hmm. of the cell. Mm -hmm. um, what are some unique patterns that you've seen from not just the general kind of you know circular mm -hmm. symmetrical uh, inflorescence, but mm -hmm. what are some other patterns and how does foidy have you noticed any sort of relationship to foidy? Yeah, that's a great question. So I mentioned the secondary heads that screams polyploidy, right? No, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, probably we, we haven't looked at all 40 independent origins of that, but, and the one that I showed you in terms of secondary head, that one is the most, um, it looks the most like a sunflower head. The secondary heads are like, um, I'm trying to think, Echinops. I don't know if anyone knows that species. Uh, it's, it's also, um, you can buy it, I'll often see it at places. It's a secondary head, so it's a different kind of put together of that. And again, like they're n we don't see any correlation between polyploidy now, but it could be that those genes were duplicated before and it, or it's lineage specific or something. I'm like dying for somebody to work on that. Um, so you should talk to me. <laughs> Let's see, hold on, there was a question over here. I know you're the boss though, but. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If it does, yeah. Yeah. So asking about, you know, once we understand hybridization, what impact is that going to have on a phylogeny? So we have talked about, like, are we going to start drawing phylogenies totally differently if we have more information? It is not realistic to think that things speciate and then they never cross again. You know, I mean, that's just not how population genetic processes work, but that's how we show them in phylogeny is that they're completely separate. So maybe a whole new way to even think about phylogenies, which is cool, right? And I don't know what it would look like, but even those network analyses that I show are not really satisfying. You know, it's like, okay, there's a red line there. It's still a phylogeny with a red line on it, right? A bifurcating phylogeny. So reimagining how we even visualize this kind of stuff, I think is, I don't even know how people will do that, but it'll be awesome to see. Yeah, good question. Next. Yeah, so, so what about secondary heads, you know, is it adaptation or is it an advantage? Are they more ecologically successful? There is a correlation or a trend, rather, 
that those secondary heads are in drier environments. And there's some idea that, so, you know, part of the, the a regular head, there's a lot of protection around the, the seeds and, and there's a lot of um, you know, protection from desiccation and that sort of thing. And then the way that a regular sunflower head disperses is like one seed will disperse. A lot of these secondary head species, the whole head disperses. So that also that extra tissue and extra nutrient may, you know, give some advantage in certain environments. So there is some evidence that secondary heads are more common in these sort of drier um, environments, but it doesn't go much beyond that. And Vicky had a hypothesis that it's like, for whatever reason, you start to get, um, you know, bigger heads and then lots of heads, and then they kind of shrink back down and like into these secondary heads. Like there's this like expansion because there, there may be some selection for needing, needing, that's not the right word, but to look like a flower, right? So once you get too many of them, there's sort of this shrinking back into still appearing as a single pseudanthium or a single flower. So that pattern could be cool to trace across the family. Again, if anyone's interested. Cool. Yes. I have one question. So the other member of SRC also has the geographic knowledge on the specific of Um, that's a great question. I only I only think we know about it in sunflower in Helianthus. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, dandelions. I don't think are doing that. And you know, it's like the they do that during the vegetative stages. Once they flower, they sort of turn west and stop because the, the, the cells are like growing at different rates throughout the day. Um, there's like a real cool circadian rhythm story. My boss studies um, circadian rhythms in animals, but he always sees the stuff in sunflowers and like sends it to me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, all I know it from is, is helianthus crop sunflower. That's a good question. I saw one, there was another one. Yes, thank you. Ray flowers and disc flowers. Yeah. Yeah. So the capitulum, there's still, if there's a capitulum, um, then they could, would probably still be in the family. But there are certainly a lot of variants where a disc flower starts to kind of look like uh, a ray flower. We were just talking about the teddy bear sunflower at lunch. So that's a mutation where those disc center disc flowers are essentially um, transformed into rays. And so it's very like ray like. Uh, yeah. And then even the discs and the rays, there's a lot of variation in how long the different corolla lobes are and they all have names. And yeah. So. And how many um, in the family? Oh, yeah. So we try to not look at polyploids as much as we can, but I mean, there are a lot of them. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, yeah, I don't know. Probably a, a lot. There are like sneaky polyploids. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are awesome. I have given talks where like no questions. <laughs> it's fun. With yes. your thousand probes that um, have you done like structure analysis to see within SRIC how many what your K is? Like, it, what's your estimated K, K in the whole family? Yeah, what do you mean by K? Sorry. Like in a like a in a structure analysis. Oh uh, oh structure. You mean yeah. like like population structure? Yeah. Okay, K. I I didn't know like which how K. Many groups how have. many groups? Oh no. Yeah. I don't know. Um, we probably, it, that would be difficult, but I see what you're saying. Cause you're trying to look at the genomic structure, essentially like genome composition. Genomics. Yeah. So like a population genetic approach to it. We haven't done that. Um, yeah. I don't, that might be hard across the family. Cause I, I don't know, you need SNPs for that, or I guess you could use the whole sequences. I don't know. Oh yeah, because you would have to align it. You'd need to align it some, but that that is brings me to this. Our probe set we've also used to pull out SNPs. So the same. So I've had I have a student working on. So you might be able to. Yeah. Well, she's done it in Helianthus. So okay. if a student studying an endangered sunflower, she uses the same probe set that we usually sequence for a whole gene for phylogenetics, but she just maps it against sunflower and calls the SNPs from it, and then does she's doing structure and stuff within 
just the helianthus part of it. So it's like dual set. Um, but maybe you could call the sense against a or something. Yeah, like, I wonder how that would work. We have to, yeah. And we have done snip trees across the family, but we haven't done structure. Structure, we might break it. <laughs> That's cool though. Yeah, okay, I'll think about that. I like bringing the pathogen. Oh, there's one more. Oh, there's, I don't even know what time it is. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Reason for the, yeah, yeah, we have noticed that, that there's sort of maybe a lag. I mean, there is this idea that there can be, you know, sort of a lag time between a duplication event and then a um, diversification event. So it could be that. Um, I, I also really wonder if we're just, it's too coarse of what we're looking at. We maybe need to do this in a more refined way, more methodical, like instead of just across the whole family. Um, but yeah, some lag time, I don't know. It could be, yeah, it could be. Maybe the duplication happens first. I mean, it has to, I guess. Or but that's what the downstream, right? The wasn't. I think the discordance is typically after the duplication, right? <laughs> I can't remember my own thing. Maybe I can. We can look afterwards if you well, want to wrap up. Me, well, Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you more questions, we'll still be outside. Feel free to chat with her. We have refreshments and snacks. So feel free to hang around and chat with us. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. I appreciate the questions. I can't wait to tell everyone there were questions. <laughs> cool. Thank you for the Zoom people. <laughs>